Praise the Lord. All right. Glory to God. God is good. Amen. The title of my message today is called Hyper. Look at your neighbor and tell him Hyper. That's right. That's the title of my message called Hyper today. Hyper. And um, I want to go to the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Amen. And we're going to go from there. Amen. Glory to God. Awesome. 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 Let's go ahead and read. It says like this. It says, yeah. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a powerful verse that has been echoed through the ages of Christianity. I want to emphasize and speak on verse 37. It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Everybody say more. He's not saying that we're conquerors. He says that we're more than conquers. When I looked up at this word in Greek, the word in Greek, it's very interesting in how it's translated. The word Greek, it means, it means hyperniako, which is this word is also shortened as hyper. The word conquer there, more than conquer, means the word hyper. The word hyper has came sometimes at a moment of what people have spoken about the word. They have called maybe a saying like hyper grace. I don't know if some of you have ever heard the saying. But they're intending that this type of uh, wording or this title that they have given grace, which is hyper grace. They've given it a title. And what they're actually saying is that if you get too much grace, you become Uh, too lascivious or you become a sinner because you're hearing too much grace so they even wrote a book about it coming against grace and they called it hyper grace but i started to study the word hyper the word hyper was the sense of saying more than a conqueror and as i looked through the pages of the bible We look at how God has intended how good he is. We see this word hyper grace in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. And in this verse, he says this. He says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, I think I got the. He says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Verse 22, he says something very powerful. And then verse 21 or in 20, 2019, 20 and 21, he is declaring that I am giving you a forgiveness above and beyond. The word of God says where sin has abound, Grace has abound each more. The word abound more means that he has given you a hyper grace in your life. He's abounded more. He's giving you more. That's what the scripture is implying. That the grace of God has given you what you have not deserved. But yet many times we don't understand certain wording. But the wording is implying that God is giving us more than a conqueror. That's why in 2 Corinthians, he gives us a sense of saying and understanding that we give God and we give God what we are. That we we come to Christ, we die to the old man, and God gave us a new state of living, a new way of life, a new, new values. God is giving us a way of thinking and a way of being. We are no longer under the identity of our past, but now we're an identity of our future. It's very vital and important that you understand that when God gives us more grace, 
doesn't mean that he's giving us more grace so that way we can continue to be the people we don't want to be because nobody here ever wants to be a person that's always losing in life. If I tell you how many people here, people here want to lose in life, nobody's going to say, me, I want to always lose. Nobody wants to live that way. Nobody wants to live that way. But we go through situations that make us a failure sometimes when we feel like we're not able to make it to the next chapter of what God is taking us. But the Bible says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, there's a, it was Romans 520. Thank you for that. Where, but where sin abound, grace abound much more. That's the word right there. Abound much more is the word hyper, hyper Grace. In other words, he's giving you, what does this word mean, hyper? The word hyper means to go beyond, over the top. It means an overwhelming overcomer. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you're an overwhelming overcomer. It means a conqueror, to overcome. Hyper means to over, to overcome. Overwhelming. What he's actually saying, he says, When I made you more than a conqueror, I made you more an overwhelming conqueror in life. So I want you to look at a person right now, your neighbor, and tell them I'm an overwhelming conqueror. That's what the Greek is saying about that scripture. He's saying you're overwhelming, over to over the top conqueror. So when he's actually saying and he's trying to talk here and he's giving us this sense in Romans 8:37. He says, you're, you, I've, given, I've, I've not just made you a conqueror, but I've made you more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. That word, more than a conqueror, again, it's overwhelming, over the top, overcoming. It's a sense of knowing that God's going to see me through even though I'm not there yet. Can you give me an amen? God loves you. Not just because you're you, but because his son died for you and you accepted Jesus Christ. Today is the result of you accepting Jesus Christ. It is the result of being a conqueror, more than a conqueror. Hyper. Everybody say hyper. This word hyper is again over the top, over the top good news. This good news that God gave you was the sense of being over the top good news. Have you ever received good news? Anybody have ever received good news? Okay, 10 people, I believe that this week in the name of, come on, right there by your head, online, right there, you're watching me. This week in the name of Jesus, you're going to receive good news. Come on, yes, give the Lord a clap offering, praise the Lord, good news. Over the top good news. That's what that word means when he said more than conquers. So when they wrote it, they wrote it in the theology of that fact of that. They wrote it upon the fact of how a person lives when they accept the grace of God. They don't understand that the grace of God delivers you. It don't empower you to sin. It delivers you from sin. And they got the concept of saying, well, look at the way they're living because of the fact of that. This is what is introduced to them. What the truth is, is that just because you're married doesn't mean you're in love. Mm, they quiet in here. Just because you're saved doesn't, know, doesn't mean you're blessed. In other words, it is the sense of living out the goodness of God that creates that blessing. It is understanding that the, the lifestyle that you live is connected to the fact of the blessings that God gives you. Even though he gave you over the top good news that he forgave you, he loves you. And yet that grace is inside of you and those blessings are within you. Guess what? You have the choice to live it out. Or to let it die within you. I don't know if you've ever received good news. But any time that God giving you good news. He gives you a purpose with that good news. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. The word of God says like this. He gives us a sense. He says who has saved us. And called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works. But according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began so he says I already had planned this that's what he says he says I already had planned this I already am purposed the sense of when you receive me that purpose is going to birth out of you 
That purpose is going to give out life to your children and give life to those around you. Is there anybody in the house of God? See, when you receive Jesus, he says purpose and grace. Do you notice that they go together? Because your purpose without grace is just works. But your purpose in grace is not with works, but it's with good works. In other words, it's with him working through you. It's no longer you trying to work them. I could understand how good of a news that in Deuteronomy when the Israelites got good news. I don't know if you've received good news, but my God, I get hyper when I get good news. I don't want to come to church to hear bad news. I don't want to go home. Come on now to a grouchy family. Hello, have you ever walked into the house and like, man, what well, hit you? Well, the truth is, is that nobody wants to live like that. But when you hear good news, come on, everybody say this week, you're going to hear good news. It just gets you this hyper sense, this sense of overcoming. You're an overcomer. A overcomer. Have you ever sent to be a, an overcomer? Like, I'm an overcomer, man. My God, I feel good right now. I feel like I'm on top of my game right now. Right? I went to the Hood Olympics out there. That's, that's what they call it. And um, we we're playing, you know, we were playing uh, cornhole, right? And as we we're playing cornhole, me and Eddie, we, were, we, we beat our first competitive team was uh, Pastor Gerardo and Angel, Pastor Angel. And, you know, had to whoop them real quick, right? Bam. We beat them. I mean, Pastor G flopped the whole time. I don't want to put nobody on blast, but he flopped. You know what I mean? I said, man, you're from Bakersfield, bro? Come on. But as we went on to the next one, I said, I'm waiting. We, me, and Eddie, uh, me and Brother Eddie waited there for like 30 minutes to an hour. We didn't play. I said, everybody else was playing. And, and he goes, and the guy comes to me. There was like eight, nine teams. And he says, well, well, it's because we, we, the, the teams you were supposed to play left. And so we had to bump you up to playing in the championships. I said, that's hyper. <laughs> that's exciting. That's good news. I'm like, man, I didn't have to work to get there and. Now we're in the championships after eight teams, and they're pretty good. But the team that we played, you know, this guy was a professional, man. He was just knocking them in, and then Eddie flops. I said, Eddie, what's up with you? And he goes, I don't know. He can't get on me. I think he's even intimidated because this guy that was next to him with his opponent was just knocking them in, knocking them in. And we got whooped so bad that I said, I don't want to play no more. But the truth is, is that have you ever had good news and this news was tied to a purpose? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 3, 10 and 11, look at the news that God gives Israel. He tells them this news that was so exciting that they have not heard some type of news. They were going through a sense, Israel was going through a sense of struggles. And God gives them this news. He gives them this promise in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 3. He says, therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. This was a sense of hearing this from a, a man of God, a prophet, to my life or to the life of Israel. It was like, what? We've been walking through this desert, and yet you're telling me that we're going to go into a land that... I'm going to be able to restore my family. God's going to give us enough. I could imagine that the fact is, is that they probably couldn't fit this thought in their head. Like, I can't see it, man. It seems like my life every day has been a problem. We've been in this desert for a long time. We've been in these arguments for a long time. Can God still restore my life? And there, in verse 10, I love it because this is the milk and honey. Ready? Ready? Here's the good news. Ready? So it shall be. Look at your neighbor and tell them, it shall be. Now, those that come on Wednesday knows what that means right now. If you know, if you're a Wednesday, 
uh, you come on Wednesday to hear the word. Can you give me an amen? Come on. B. He's not telling them you're going to accordingly. He says B. He gives them the sense that so it shall be Israel. When the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a large and beautiful cities, which you did not, which you did not, which you did not. Come on, everybody say it with me. One, two, three. Not build. You did not build. Say it again. You did not. That's right. You didn't build it. There was something that you didn't cause. I'm giving you this just because you're going to serve me. Just because you're going to serve me, Israel, I'm going to give you houses you did not build. I'm going to beautify the cities. I'm going to do something new in your life that you never thought. Some of you have been struggling to become that more of a conqueror. But you have not seen the blessings of God. You haven't seen the hyper side of it. You've been like, okay, we, we got a breakthrough, but it's not the breakthrough. I understand that. But he's telling Israel a promise here. Verse 11 says this, he says, he gives them, he says, he says, house is full of all good things. Come on, everybody say all good things. Close your eyes right there where you're at. Ready? Repeat after me. Lord, thank you for all the good things in my house. Do you believe it? That's the good news. Come on, that's hyper. Can you give me an amen? Look at your neighbor and say, that's conquering right there. Well, I don't have it. I understand. But the truth is, Israel didn't have it. They had to believe in a promise that they couldn't see. That's what the grace of God is, is that I don't see it, but I know that it's overwhelming over my life, overwhelming conquering, overwhelming good news. I don't deserve to be forgiven. I don't deserve to have my family. I don't deserve to be here in church this morning. But it's an overwhelming good news that he conquered so you could be free this morning. He's a good God. Can you give him an amen? Which you did not fill, hewn out wells. He said, you didn't dig out these wells. You're not going to dig out these wells. Look at your neighbor and tell him, they already dug the wells. All you need to do is get the water. Some people like to dig wells. I don't like to dig a well. I thank God that God already gave me the spring living water. He dug the well. I need to drink that water. Can you give him an amen? Look at your neighbor. It's not your works. It's who God is. It's the finished work of God. It's not what you're doing. Someone, come on, keep on digging. Come on, build it, honey. Let's keep on building. No, you keep on building. Listen to me. It's going to come down. But when you let the Lord build your house, when you let the Lord do, he will be a promise. Can you give me an amen? This is exciting news. This is exciting news. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to hear this. Some of you are like, well, I don't know. Then <laughs> you don't know what the good news is then. He says, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant when you have eaten and are what? And are what? It's okay. You could repeat it. It's okay. You could repeat it. God, you're going to make me full, full of joy, full of peace, full of his goodness. This is full, full of patience. Come on, lately, I've been needing some of that. I need full of patience. They taught me not to pray for patience. But I say today, pray for the fruit of the Spirit. Pray for patience. Because patience is good. And Israel needed patience. It takes time through your process of restoration. It's not going to come from one year to the next. You get saved today and all of a sudden, boom, everything's fixed. Listen to me. It takes time. It takes time to build your life. It takes time for God to uplift you and strengthen you and take you to the next level of your life. Some of you used to, you're so used to working and doing your thing that you don't know how to receive from God because all your life you did it. You worked it. You got your blessings. You did it. Praise God. I'm excited that you did that. But there's another way of doing this that you could not go down when you go to the top. Listen to me. It is through the Lord Jesus Christ. When you give your life to him, he takes you there and he keeps you there. Even when you're in trouble. That's hyper grace. Can you give me an amen? That's good news. That is so good news. Israel had a problem to understand this. We'll start revealing Jesus in a little bit as our ministry teaches. 
But Israel had a problem that after Israel died, everybody from 25 and above had died in the desert because they could not receive these promises. It was hard for them to see that there was going to be houses that they didn't build. All my life, I've been struggling. I've been collecting from the government all my life. I know how to make it myself. I know how to go do this, do that, do this. But to wait there and let God bless me, it just has felt insignificant when I'm not trying to do something for myself. I feel inadequate. I feel like I'm a loser. I feel like I'm not making something happen. So Israel tried to do it on their own. I'll go work it. Let me get going. And yet Israel ended up losing their forefathers, their fathers and their forefathers right before their eyes. Where he says, everybody that's 25 and below, you're going to go into the promised land. Everybody that's 25 and above, you're going to die in this desert. What a bad news to hear. But every time, understand, before you get bad news, I want you to hear me really quick and just give me your attention for five times five minutes. I was good, huh? <laughs> that when you hear the good news and you don't receive that good news and you speak negative against that, then the bad news comes and takes you because you didn't receive what I said. I said you're going to receive this. Why are you so negative about standing still through the process while I get you there? Don't complain. I've made you more than a conqueror. Israel, I want you to go in with your children. I want you to be blessed. And yet, another generation got born. Generation was Joshua's generation. And look at what he tells Joshua, the generation in Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. He tells them, after receiving this promise, the, 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 Joshua is the only leader that makes it within his generation. And God tells this to Joshua. When Joshua's getting ready to go into battle, he says, every place, look at this promise, ready? Every place, come on, everybody say, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses. Well, Moses is dead by now. I said it to Moses, but why didn't he receive it? Why didn't Moses go into the promised land like it was promised? Why did God replace him with leadership? Because Moses did not receive the first promise of what he said. He said, I'm going to give you houses you did not build, Moses. Be patient with me and stop complaining in your mind. Moses, the second time after he was leading his leadership, got so frustrated with the people. Has any fathers ever got frustrated with their family? Has any mothers ever gotten frustrated? And they started leading their families with frustration. And they started to speak with frustration. I've been there. And they start not noticing that. Listen to me. If I said I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. You're not going to live in that apartment too long. You're not going to rent too long. You're not going to be in that job too long. I'm going to bless you. Something you did. That's high for grace. That's a grace that I did not deserve. I didn't deserve what I have today. That's the goodness of God. He tells Joshua, and Joshua receives this message. Everywhere you put your foot on, I'm going to give you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquer. Now, I want you to th think right now, imagine three areas of your life right now that you see your foot, putting your foot in those areas and conquering. Ready? On the count of three, you're going to just imagine them. One, two, three. Imagine it. Three, three areas that you're putting your foot down. You see that? See that imagination that's called faith in grace. Faith without grace is dead and grace without faith is dead. The reason why they call it hyper grace is because we don't use faith. Faith is needed for grace. That's what Ephesians 2, 8 says. Don't go there. It says you've been saved by grace through faith. So when faith is challenging, faith is an area of our life that sometimes we don't want to confront. It's the faith to believe for it to happen when how God showed it to you. 
And the generation, here comes a new generation. And Joshua receives that mandate to say, okay, I got the purpose now. I got the purpose, but now I need to understand the grace. How are you going to do this? That's through my grace. Not just through my grace. I'm going to conquer through a hyper conquer. Come on now. Overwhelming conquer. Hyper grace. What do you mean? Yes, you're going to receive good news. By the time you get there, Joshua, I'm going to do something new. Joshua needed to understand this concept of grabbing it. This is why Hebrews 10, 5 says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Come on, everybody say, never leave us nor forsake us. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but did I give you the wrong verse? I probably did. He will never leave us nor forsake us. The sense of him not leaving us nor forsaking us is a sense that he's with us. Joshua, I'm with you. Now, I want you to say your name. In your name, when I say Joshua, don't think of Joshua. Think of you. I've given you this promise. I've landed this promise in your hand. I am with you. I'm going to bless you. I am with you. Can you give me an amen? Hey, Hebrews 13, 5, I wrote it wrong. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's very vital and important that he is with us. And that we move accordingly to the instructions that the Lord has given us. As a ministry, you just don't come here just to come to church. But you're part of a family. You're part of a, a movement that God has created to win souls for Jesus. You've surrendered your two hours or hour and a half on Sundays to come and say, this is my church. And I'm going to sit there to hear the word. And I'm going to have purpose in my church. And as I receive this purpose, I know God is going to take me into that supernatural level of my life. Come on, give the Lord a clap off for him. You're going to give it to him. Give it to him. That's right. So he tells Joshua three things. The first battle, one of the first battles within the walk of Joshua, which he had a couple of them, but one of them we're going to talk about. Joshua had a battle. See, this verse that he gave him, I'm with you. And then he tells him in verse 9, wherever you go. And then after that, after he receives a promise in chapter 1, he goes into battles. But the battles were won before he even got there. It seems like I don't need to strive to try to restore my life. I need to believe that I'm restored. Even before the cross, they believed in the finished work. They believed that God is going to do it. All we need to do is show up. So Joshua showed up in Joshua chapter 6. We see in chapter 6 where Joshua's coming in with the Israelites. And we see walls around the city. And these walls were the fortified walls that protected the city of evilness where people, evil people were inside, but yet the Israelites were outside. This belonged to Israel. This is my life. This is my wife. This is my husband. This is my home. God, this is my, my income. I will not live my life like this, God. And yet the walls seem like, have you ever noticed that this year it seems like walls are around for you to do anything you're trying to do? It seems like an opposition in everything you do. It's like you're trying to get out of a hole that you were in, but somehow, amen, somehow within the Israelites, I could imagine why they died 25 and adult, adult, he's his adult way of acting, not believing in the promise was starting to him and infiltrate within, within their, within their kids. And God didn't want their kids to have that attitude. He says, you're infiltrating your attitude within the younger generation. They're seeing you become a quitter. They're seeing you talk negative. They're seeing you complain. So this new generation arises. And as he arises, in Joshua chapter 6, we know the story, right? He says, walk around seven times and then shout, boom, the walls come down. Look at your neighbor and tell him, take care of your testimony while you're around people. Come on, tell him, tell him, take care of your testimony. Take care of the way you act. Your character. Take care of your character because your children are watching you. People are watching you. And you matter. Your attitude matters. That's why it's very vital and important that you don't have these episodes in your family. I just had one of those days. No, we don't want to see those days. Those days are over. 
The truth is, is that those days were dead when I came to Christ. God, I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. All things have passed away. All old things have passed away. And now in Jericho, they were coming up and he shouts and the walls come down. But I want to talk about after the walls. When the breakthrough came, God told jo Joshua a couple of points. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 18, points that God has given me in my personal life that has been always prospered me in my life. So the walls come down, right? Boom, they're in victory. And God speaks to them. And he says, and you, by all means, he tells them, abstain from the, from the accursed things. Lest you become a curse when you take off, take, take off the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. He says, listen to me, there's going to be things that you cannot bring along with you. What he's actually telling them is that the blessings that I'm going to give you, don't use them for destructive things. He spoke to me this years ago when I was barely coming to the things of the Lord. He had told me, listen to me, I'm going to bless you, but don't use my blessings for destructive things. He told Joshua, I'm tearing down those walls. You should be on death row. You should lose. You shouldn't be married right now. You shouldn't have your children. And I understood that, that it came with the covenant, that my life came with the covenant because of where I come from and how God took me. Listen to me. You're not too far from me. Come on now, can you give me? You might have not done what I've done, but it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. And you lacked in some areas. And yet God saved you. God restored you. God touched you. And he said, don't take your blessings to destructive things. Don't use them against me. Don't use your money against me. Don't use your family against me. Don't use your kids against me. Don't punish your kids because they're in the church. Don't punish your wife because she's serving God. Don't punish your, your husband because they're doing something for God. Don't be the jealous husband, jealous wife. Don't take them. Don't use what I've given you for destructive. And some of you have gotten saved and God restored you and took you out of the miry clay and put you in a good standing. And yet many times you have allowed the enemy to destroy, to destroy the one thing that God's re restored. He restored it. God's done something, but with your same mouth, with your same attitude, you destruct it, you destroy it. And so he tells Joshua that don't go to the accursed. Don't live with other cursing. I deliver you from that curse. Don't go back to that curse, Joshua. Make sure that the children of Israel understand that the blessings are going to start coming to them because there's going to be a lot of them. He says those blessings, don't use them to go out of the camp. Don't start using them against, against what I believe. Don't go open up that six-pack of beer, Joshua. Remember, you didn't have nothing. I deliver you from that alcohol. Joshua, don't go back and putting the money that I gave you to live a, a life that is dead to you. And then in number two, in verse 19, he tells them this in 619. He says, but all the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. In other words, what he's actually saying says, listen to me, teach the people that what I'm going to give them, make sure they give back. I bless them with that job. I bless them with what they have. It is the Lord that creates wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, it's the Lord that creates wealth. It's the Lord that blesses you. The Lord gives you the strength to get up in the morning and to go to work. Can you give me an amen? I don't know if you've ever been sick. Has anybody ever been sick? Well, you couldn't go to work. And all you were praying is that I just want to get up and go to work, God, because we need finances. Do you remember that? And yet God heals you and you get up and you get back into life and you forget of what God has done for your life. Joshua, don't forget me and the house that you belong to. Don't forget about it. And I understood this, that as my, as I was, I got married with my wife and, and, uh, which is my anniversary was Thursday, 26 years. We've seen the challenges come before us. When God says, listen to me, you want to be blessed? You want this grace that I've bestowed upon you? You want this grace to start working in your life? I could prosper you. But I'm going to take you through a journey first. 
a journey to work your faith to continue to believe on what I'm going to do. And even though you don't see it, I'm going to do it. So he says, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. Make sure that to what you get, you're honoring God. This is very vital that when you get paid, your finances, pray before you even use and slide the first card. Pray, say, God, thank you. Thank you for blessing me this month, this week, this, these two weeks with what you've given me. And Lord, I give back to you. The vital importance about this is that you're honoring God. Why are you honoring God? Because God bestowed a, a, a grace that you didn't deserve. It's not because he's asking for it. God's not asking something from you. He's asking you that you've received something. So now out of what you receive, because you've been forgiven much, he told this woman, you love much now. I'm giving something back to you. Honor God with what he gave you. And then the third one, in the next verse, he says this, he says, in verse, uh, let's go to Joshua 8, 27. He says, I want you to take some plunder for yourself. I, I need you to learn how to receive. He says, only the livestock and the spoil of the city Israel took of body. Now, let's, let's, look at, let, let's look at this, okay? Let's not look at it like it years ago. Let's look at it like right now. What is he telling me right now? According to the word of the Lord, he says, he says take what I'm going to tell you to take. Don't take what is not yours. Take what I'm going to tell you to take. Don't take what is yours, what is not yours. Don't go and taking things that are not yours. Make sure this is what you're going to take. And he tells them, receive it while you take it. In other words, you're going to receive the plunder. You're going to receive the blessing for yourself. And as you receive this blessing, you're going to learn how that I'm going to bless you. You're going to be blessed and people are going to know that you're blessed. Look at your neighbor and tell them not every blessing is a good blessing. That's right. Well, they call it a blessing. We understand they call it a blessing. But sometimes those blessings that we call blessings are cursings that come into our family that mess up our family. Where'd you get that generator? Well, I don't know. I just bought it off the dude. You know he stole it. Don't receive it. Well, that's not my problem yet. It's your problem. Because you're allowing things to come into your camp that is not of God. He says, I'm going to give you the receipt for what you're going to buy. You don't need to get stuff that is not yours. Wow. Amen, Pastor Mike. I receive that. And some of us, it don't benefit us because that's what we make our life out of. Out of cutting corners and cheating things and, and trying to cheat this and cheat the government. Cheat, 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 cheat. And nothing but allowing yourself not to become. And if you allow yourself to become this person, you're going to end up becoming a person that constantly is first. Why? Because you're receiving things that are not yours. He says, don't take nothing but what I'm going to tell you to take. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I don't need to cheat my way through. God's grace is sufficient. I don't need to borrow no kids. I don't need to live ghetto. I don't need to live this manner of living. I could live a good life. God will bless me. God will bless me. Can you give me an amen? Out of this, Joshua, he started to see God move through his life as he started to hold the fact of every conquering. In Joshua chapter 12, verse 7 through 24, we're not going to read the whole thing, but it's exciting to start seeing how God starts blessing Joshua and the Israelites for everything that they do. This, this week, in the name of Jesus, some of you are going to receive that job you've been praying for. I declare it in your life. And through this, he says, and these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel conquered. Everybody say conquer. He conquered each and one of these, each one. Let's just read a couple of them. He says conquered on this side of the Jordan on the west, which Baal Gad in the valley of the Liban. Let's keep on going as far as the Mount 
keep on going. Joshua gave to the tribes of Israel a possession according to their division. He says, here, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do something new. Listen to me. When God's grace comes within your life and th- that grace is unmerited, undeserved favor, the finished work of Jesus, he comes and he gives you what you did not deserve. Joshua and Israel did not deserve this. Verse 8. Keep it going. He says, in the mountain country, in the lowlands, and he keeps on going, Amorites. And says the, and then this is the conquering, the king of Jericho. Keep on going. Keep on going. Verse 10, he says, the king of Jerusalem. Keep on going. The king of Jermoth. Keep on going. Ilgon, the king of Ilgon, the king of debris, the king of Gorma, the king, the king, the king of cancer, the king of poverty, the king. He is a conqueror. And he said, 37 times Joshua conquered 37 countries. Thirty-seven times he went into battle. Thirty-seven times all these kings that were kings and principalities that were always coming against a wickedness. And some of you have allowed that demon that spirit that has conquered your mind to give you a bad attitude to give you a hard character to give you a sense that you don't have a sense of believing when you look at the people of Israel so much the people of Israel start getting on your nerves the people that you love have they got on your nerves before oh See, some of you don't want to see me. Raise your hand. You're lying too. Man, you get on my nerves, but I love you still. Get on my nerves. Oh my God, I'm frustrated. That's why he said, listen to me, Joshua. I'm going to bless you. It's not through your works. Stop looking at the faults of whatever else does. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Joshua, if you take your eyes off, you're not going to be able to see the 37 times more that I'm going to conquer, more than a conquer. Name something right now that you need God to conquer. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three, name it. See? It was probably three voices that I heard. If I tell you again, you're going to go, re- you're going to say it, watch. One, two, three. See? But when God tells you to be ready, he don't tell you to be ready when you're ready. He tells you to be ready because he has called you to be ready. He says, I'm going to bless you. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to do something. Hold on. Joshua, don't live the way your forefathers. The blessing has crossed over to Joshua. And he says, listen to me. The blessing that I've given uh, Moses and what I've said to Moses is still upon you. And then Joshua conquered 37 times. And you know what happens after he conquered? In the last, in, 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 in the book of Joshua, you know what he says? He says he conquered the last king. And after he conquered, he says that Joshua was old of age. And he says he comes to die. After Joshua died, they had to apply judges. Because the people have forgotten about God. You forget about the small stuff like, let's pray for our food before we, we eat our food. Let's pray for, for, for thank God for the for protection before we leave and tra- traveling mercy. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray God. Let's pray for the, let's pray. Let's, let's be attentive to, to what God is doing. Don't forget that. Don't use your life to be destructive and feeding people that are not serving God. And yet you're giving them the power to believe that they could continue doing what they're doing and you're with them. Be careful. Be careful. Don't feed destructive, a destructive lifestyle. And now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. He says, I got to this point. Guess who came? That's who came later to come, right? David comes to finish the job. Your generation is going to finish a job that you started. But I pray that you don't die knowing 
that God wants to bless you. I love what Second Peter to tie up this to the finished work and to reveal Jesus. I love what Second Peter chapter one verse three says. It gives us a promise, a new covenant promise, just like what he gave Joshua. He says to you, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. He says, as his divine power has given to us a couple of things, some things, all. Do you believe that? Healing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God wants you to empower your life to live out a good life? You have the power within you to live out a good life. That's what he told Joshua in sense of saying, listen to me, anywhere you put your foot on, I'm going to give to you. He's telling you this morning, he's telling you, I, I, my divine power, his, which is Jesus, right? Christ, as Christ, his is Christ, Jesus, divine power has given to me. I'm going to take that personal to me. All things that pertain to life and godliness, life and godliness, not just godliness not just spiritual like some people say well i got a spiritual inheritance be careful because life follows after godliness godliness follows after life they go together god raises you up and he says now i'm going to bless you so you can bless your generations 